Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. Today's date is April 6, 2021, and in this video we're going to read the preamble to the Libertarian Party platform and comment on it from a Marxist perspective. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe and consider supporting me on Patreon. There's a link in the description. So twice now I have attempted, you know, we do a lot of audiobooks on this channel of socialist theory with some commentary and discussion, kind of like a book club. And because I have commented on the impossibility of a left-right political alliance, as some who delve into horseshoe theory like to claim as possible, um, I have commented on the impossibility of that, and I thought, well, you know, why don't I just go to some of the source material of, you know, how and why I came to understand that this is not possible, and share that with people. So, the Libertarian Party platform is, I think, a decent way to do that. The thing is, you don't have to read the whole thing to get the point. In fact, it's nearly impossible. I've tried starting commentary, and it became very clear that although it's not a very long document, it would take me like five or six hours minimum to properly comment on and dissect this monstrosity, which is what it is. So we're just going to look at the preamble, that should probably suffice, and we're going to look at the 1972 preamble. This was the first official platform, they had a temporary one in 71, this was the first official platform of the party, the first year that they ran presidential candidates, and I think what is critical to understand, this is the point in time when the capitalist class was really beginning in earnest their project of neoliberalism. What is neoliberalism? Well, it is a return to classical liberalism. Neo, new, liberalism, well, liberalism, or unregulated free market capitalism. That's what they want. Away from what? Like, why is it new? Why is it new liberalism? Well, we had had social democracy, which was basically capitalism's answer to socialism. Like, we capitalists aren't going to give up our power, but we'll regulate our system somewhat so it's not quite so unstable and doesn't look quite as terrible next to socialism. This is on a, a number of levels. I mean, this helped them buy off the petty bourgeoisie and large parts of the working class, you know, thereby ensuring that uh, fewer people would organize for revolution. Anyway, that's a longer discussion, but back to classical liberalism and the push for neoliberalism. Well, we saw in the 70s, this was the time that the conservative counter-revolution was starting to get organized and gain popularity. This consensus was starting to form. And then in 1980, the election of Ronald Reagan, libertarians saw, by and large, a huge win in that election because libertarian mostly is just a front for totally unregulated free market capitalism. They do dress it up with some idealism about civil liberties. Um, those are not necessarily that controversial. But at best, libertarianism is an extremely utopian kind of idealism. And at worst, it is a harbor and shelter for those who realize that that's what it is, and actually are crypto-fascist, meaning they just want a system of total privatization where workers have basically no rights, and uh, I mean, you're impoverished. That's pretty much what happens. That's what we're seeing now. We're 40 years into neoliberalism, um, and conditions are as bad as they have been in decades for working people. I mean, we're struggling much more than the previous generations who had more of that intact social democratic system. Yet libertarians who can, you know, never have a pure enough system of robber baron capitalism, they will uh, point to all of the problems that you're experiencing now, which are actually consequences of deregulation and privatization, the exact same things that they pushed for. And they will say that, no, these are actually problems because of the residual traces of social democracy left over. They're not your friends. You can't work with them as a socialist, except on extremely limited issues, maybe pertaining to a few civil libertarian issues. But as far as economic liberty, what they mean by that is the exact opposite of what we want as socialists. So 
let's get into this document with a little bit of historical framing here for reference, who these people are, what their ideas have contributed to. That suffering you're experiencing right now, they had a huge hand in it. And why do we say that they are utopian idealists? Well, because we're materialists and we say that if material conditions don't support an idea, then that idea can't find expression in reality. This is basically what libertarianism is all about. They claim a lot of ideals which can't be supported in capitalism. And in fact, their fervent desire to cling to capitalism holds us back from attaining them for workers. Here we go. Okay, so this is the 1972 platform of the Libertarian Party, quote, the party of principle, adopted in convention, Denver, Colorado, June 17 to 18, 1972. First section, Statement of Principles. Adopted unanimously by the delegates to the First National Convention of the Libertarian Party on June 17, 1972. We, the members of the Libertarian Party, challenge the cult of the omnipotent state. Wow. And defend the rights of the individual. Comment. There's your first line. Couldn't be clearer. State bad, individual good. Now, by state, I'm going to say something you hear from libertarians all the time is that they're anti-collectivist. They literally just don't like recognizing even society. Like, they don't like recognizing social groups larger than the individual. This is, I don't even know what to call it. I mean, it's anti-scientific for one. Social science can show us an enormous amount about, well, even the individual. Because the reality is, while there are certain things wired into our brains in terms of instincts, largely, if you get inside an individual, what you see is a microcosm of the society which socialized that individual. We carry norms, values, goals, knowledge, and many other things from the society in which we were raised. Libertarians want to reduce your social consciousness and mystify the subject by basically saying that these things are parts of nature and thereby, I mean, they've created a mystification which is aimed at preventing social change. How do we change society? By understanding it. Just like we change chemicals by understanding chemistry or we change biology and do medicine by understanding biology. It's the same with society. We understand society through sociology, through Marxism, and then we can change it. Libertarians really want to keep things exactly as they are, and hence this mystification. So that is line number one. Going back to the document. We hold that each individual has the right to exercise sole dominion over his own life and has the right to live his life in whatever manner he chooses so long as he does not forcibly interfere with the equal right of others to live their lives in whatever manner they choose. So commenting, this is what libertarians call the non-aggression principle. It's as long as you do not engage in force, actually making someone do something else, or fraud, uh, deceiving someone into doing something that, basically not getting their informed consent, right? So basically making people do things that they don't want to do using some kind of what they call aggression. Then everything's cool. So the problem with this is that, I mean, there are whole branches of, for example, sociology dedicated to the study of power, force, authority, which is institutionalized power, influence, coercion, etc. And these are not neat lines. They are very blurry. So here's the basic thing, tying this back to statement one, that it's all about protecting the rights of the individual. There are a couple of problems with this. For one thing, humans do engage in collective activity constantly. In fact, you could say that it is the rule rather than the exception. And that's particularly the case the more that industry becomes socialized, whether under capitalism or whether under socialism, the whole idea of arguing for socialism is in part that industry and technology have advanced to the point where 
no individual creates something just by themselves. It's all coming from a shared base of knowledge and technology and collective effort. Very rare is the product, which is just worked on by one pair of hands. The other problem is that if we were to strictly hold to this interpretation of human activity, then you would basically be having to reinvent the wheel every time that there was a conflict. You would have to judge every situation of alleged force or fraud on you know, a new basis with, with each new incident. Otherwise, what's wrong with the existing system of laws, which, although it is skewed towards capitalists because we live in capitalism and all ideology is a product of capitalism and capitalism, but the basic fact remains that we have a justice system which is aimed at conflict resolution. In other words, part of this is force and fraud in the many different forms in which those occur or allegedly occur. And so back to the basic point of not everyone agrees on what force and fraud are. Oh, well, so libertarians have this idea that there is this completely objective standard and that these things never need to be argued about, for example, in court, which is pretty much what court is for. I hope you're starting to see some of the glaring foundational flaws. We're only on the second line. Let me read some more of this. Governments throughout history have regularly operated on the opposite principle, that the state has the right to dispose of the lives of individuals and the fruits of their labor. Even within the United States, all political parties other than our own grant to government the right to regulate the life of the individual and seize the fruits of his labor without his consent. Comment, they mean taxes. That's what they're talking about. They mean taxation. You have a party here which is completely opposed to the state redistributing anything. Anything. Do you think that this is compatible with socialism? Let me know in the comments. We, on the contrary, deny the right of any government to do these things and hold that the sole function of government is the protection of the rights of each individual, namely, one, the right to life, and accordingly we support laws prohibiting the initiation of physical force against others. A bold stance commenting, you know, wow, you're anti-murder, good for you. Two, the right to liberty of speech and action, and accordingly we oppose all attempts by government to abridge the freedom of speech and press, as well as government censorship in any form, and three, the right to property. And accordingly, we oppose all government interference with private property. Comment. Do you still think this is compatible with socialism? We oppose all government interference with private property. Let's continue. Such as confiscation, nationalization, and eminent domain, and support laws which prohibit robbery, trespass, fraud, and misrepresentation. Since government has only one legitimate function, the protection of individual rights, we oppose all interference by government in the areas of voluntary and contractual relations among individuals. Men should not be forced to sacrifice their lives and property for the benefit of others. They should be left free by government to deal with one another as free traders on a free market and the resultant economic system, the only one compatible with the protection of man's rights, is laissez-faire capitalism. Here ends the statement of principles. Do you think that a political party founded on the idea that, quote, the only system compatible with what they view as the protection of human rights is laissez-faire capitalism? What do you think? Is that compatible with socialism? If you do, get the fuck out. Go back to square one, because seriously, I, I don't know what to say. What libertarians are about, in a nutshell, let me give you the statement of principles, is they want to go back to the pre-social democracy era. They want to go back to robber baron capitalism and make it even purer, like the absolute bare minimum of laws, basically no laws on business. 
So again, like th- this is why libertarians today, they will defend corporations that pollute and all this other kind of stuff, even though, I mean, they're violating people's right to clean drinking water, which you could say putting poison in someone's drinking water, that's force. <laughs> like that, that is a violent act. But again, they will define it down to like, unless you sort of like with your bare hand or with an implement strike someone else, it's not fucking forced. I hope you see already from the statement of principles, which concludes again, they should be left free by government to deal with one another as free traders on a free market. And the resultant economic system, the only one compatible with the protection of man's rights is laissez faire capitalism done. So they will criticize the status quo but only insofar as it still bears traces of social democracy. They want to go back pre-New Deal. They want to go back to kids working in coal mines. Yes, they're anti-minimum wage laws. They're anti-child labor laws in many cases. I mean, that is the logical conclusion. You might find some libertarians who aren't for that. But basically, their philosophy is have no laws on business except for the absolute bare minimum. And that to them doesn't count as the bare minimum. Additionally, in some cases, you I mean, if you look right now on search on like libertarian private court, libertarian private police, you will find elaborate libertarian theories about how we should privatize police, privatize the courts. Like we as socialists feel that already the system is too controlled by capitalists that if you're a capitalist it's so much easier to get away with everything and the whole system is set up to oppress the working class and keep working for capitalists excluding maybe you know just a few what they would see as bad apple capitalists here and there but i mean our criticism and their criticism of the status quo are completely different not compatible end up at fundamentally different places and Let me point out a few other things before we wrap up here with this preliminary volley into, you know, examining libertarian quote unquote thought. That last claim about free market laissez faire capitalism being, you know, the best one for liberty and all that, there's no evidence or rationale given for that claim. It's a major, major claim. It's the concluding thought of the statement of principles. And yet, there's no evidence or data there's there's nothing given you're just supposed to accept this mystification a lot of all of this is a quasi nationalistic restatement of principles of the american revolution which was a bourgeois revolution which had many uh commonalities with say the french revolution around the same time this was a revolution of the capitalist class against the monarchy The entire state of industry and the class composition of the U.S. and Europe were completely different in the late 18th century, late 1700s, than they are today. I mean, even around the time of the Civil War, I believe in the United States, the proletariat class of dispossessed wage workers whose only commodity to sell is our labor, that was about 10% of the U.S. population at that time. Today, it's flipped. It's 90%. So basically, like libertarians are taking the political philosophy of an agrarian society just starting to move into capitalism and trying to like re-embrace that. I mean, it's, it's wildly out of date is the point. From a material analysis, society has moved to a completely different position with, again, different class composition to the society. The interests are just not the same. We're not fighting the monarchy anymore. We're in a completely different point. But because this is the mythology that a lot of people, you know, in the U.S. school system, for example, grow up with, you know, we were taught that those things that the American Revolution was fought over were timeless, universal principles rather than products of a specific struggle between classes at a particular point in the development of the means of production. That is what we as Marxists say. So libertarians to this day play on that idea that these are just universal, timeless concepts not tied to any particular class interests. 
That's a major way that they hook people in. American workers, I mean, U.S. people, I wish there was a better adjective, United Statesian workers uh, are some of the least class conscious. I mean, that may be changing now, but especially, you know, in the 1970s, there was this big sense of class collaboration and class unity between capitalists and workers. And that propaganda, Cold War propaganda, was raging. And, you know, the capitalists got a lot of buy-in to their bullshit. Um, Now, libertarianism should be considered totally crackpot. The data that we do have support the exact opposite conclusions that they claim where they're even bold enough to just claim any specific outcomes other than just freedom and liberty, which are, of course, open-ended concepts that don't actually do that well in the abstract. Liberty and freedom are best defined in relation to some particular kind of bondage or restriction rather than just talked about, you know, in, in the abstract. They, they don't actually mean that much without being defined against something else. Nevertheless, I mean, that doesn't stop libertarians from doing that. Um, this should be considered crackpot, but capitalism is in crisis. That's part of the way that this faction of capitalists have risen Uh, Maybe not as, you know, the Libertarian Party, but their ideas of neoliberalism have risen to such prominence. Capitalism is in crisis, and they're trying to double down, double down, and just go harder and harder and harder. You've probably heard how the Reagan people took credit for bringing down the Soviet Union. Well, they think, I mean, whether it's true or not, they think that this kind of like hardball, you know, hyper capitalist philosophy that sells working people these utopian ideals of like liberty and freedom without, you know, while undercutting the economic basis of like actually having those things for them. It thinks it can just play this kind of insane, psychotic hardball and get results, the results that it's looking for. We're, you know, 40 plus years into that process. How do you think it's going? And as for working people who still buy into this, I mean, yeah, we should try to educate them where we can. But the libertarians I've talked to, it's like there's something broken upstairs, like there's something missing. Uh, I wish we could reach more of these people because they are a liability. They're anti-communists, fervent anti-communists. But there's only so much you can do. Educate the people who seem like you can educate them. If that includes some libertarians, then tremendous. But by and large, I think these are some of the most resistant people out there. Just don't waste undue amounts of time. That's mainly what I'm saying. And this whole idea of like a horseshoe theory, left-right convergence. um, Yeah, I think it's time to retire that one. We're literally fighting for diametrically opposed things. Well, for diametrically opposed classes. Libertarians fight for capitalists. Socialists fight for workers. It really is that simple whether or not libertarians have the class consciousness to understand it. On that, we're going to end the video. Thanks for listening. If you have a comment, leave a comment. Usually generates some interesting discussion. If you like this video, again, please click like, subscribe, and consider supporting us on Patreon. Thanks to our current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, as little as $2 a month can make it happen. Every donation is encouraging and helpful, so much thanks for that. We also greatly thank people who can share our videos on their social media, on Twitter, on Facebook, wherever you're online. Passing around the videos helps to bring these ideas to a larger audience. Thanks again for all your contributions, and we will see you in the next video.